Hello everyone, in this video we'll be talking about moving from logical to physical models, both process models and data models. The learning objectives for this video are as follows. After watching, students should be able to revise logical DFDs and ERDs into physical DFDs and physical database designs. Physical DFDs are covered in Chapter 10 and will be on the exam. Physical data models are covered in Chapter 11 and are redundant with material that you learned in ISDS 402. So these will not be on the exam, but I'd like you to review this material and be able to do it for your project this semester. Let's start with physical process models. Physical process models show the implementation details and explain how the system will work, including actual specific technology, the format of information, and human interaction with the system. In our logical process model, or our logical DFDs, we didn't specify whether any of the processes were performed by humans or machines, or if they were performed by machines, what type of technology would be used to implement them. The physical DFD contains the same components as the logical DFD, like those you see on the right, external entities, data flows, data stores, and processes. The same rules pertaining to balance and decomposition apply. That is, we'll still have a context diagram, level 0, level 1, etc. However, the physical DFD contains additional details describing how the system will be built. Here's a checklist of steps to create the physical DFD. First, draw a human-machine boundary. This helps you specify which part of the system will be implemented through computerized programs and which part of the system will still be done manually. The human-machine boundary is a dotted line. The decision of whether something should be digitized or not depends on the costs and benefits of those decisions and the potential efficiency of digitizing a process that was previously done manually. The next step is to add implementation references. This should be done for data stores, data flows, and processes, but not external entities, because by definition external entities are outside of our system. Implementation references could be the field or table where something is implemented in a database, could be a specific form or input screen or report output, or the type of program or language used to implement a process. You can see in the example here that Process 3, Promote Tunes, will be programmed using Visual Basic, so that has been added to the diagram. The data flows, customer interests, and recent sales will be stored as fields in a MySQL database, so that detail has been added here as well. And the customer interests data store and sales data store are shown here as MySQL tables. The next step is to add system-related data stores, data flows, and processes. For example, if you're doing any backups, exceptions, or audit trails, these are things that weren't documented in the logical DFD, but will need to be documented in the physical DFD. Finally, you need to update your data descriptions and metadata in your case repository or whatever other form of documentation you're using for the project. I've listed this step in gray because this step is not reflected on your actual diagram. These are things that are reflected in your additional documentation. Here's a great example from the textbook contrasting a logical and a physical DFD. Let's look at this more closely, one step at a time. In the logical DFD, we've listed all of our processes regardless of whether they will be completed by a human or a computer. However, in the physical DFD, we've noted that there is a boundary between our external entities, our marketing managers and customers, and the rest of the system, which will be implemented digitally. If systems will be completely digitized, often the human-machine boundary will only be around the external entities. However, this is not always the case. In some organizations, you'll have processes that are completed partly by humans and partly by computers. The next step was to add implementation details. So in the logical DFD, you can see that all of the processes, data flows, and data stores have very generic names. However, when we move to the physical DFD, in this case, several of the data flows are fields in a MySQL database. The data stores are tables in a database, which is usually the case. Some other data flows are paper forms, such as a sales patterns report. Others might be web page forms, like here we have an HTML form for email promotion messages. And for the processes, we list how they will be implemented. In this case, the Promote Tunes app will be programmed using Visual Basic. The third step in moving from logical to physical is to add system-related data stores, data flows, and processes. In this case, you can see they've added one additional data store, which is this access table containing email promotions. In the logical DFD, 
they only considered emailing the customers, but now that they're looking at the physical DFD, they're thinking about creating backup copies of the emails that they send and saving those emails in an access database. So they've added that as a data flow and a data store in their physical model. Let's take a look at another example. Here's a DFD that we saw earlier in the semester from the Bloomington Boutique. Let's go through the steps to convert this DFD from logical to physical. Again, the first step is to create a human machine boundary. Bloomington Boutique has decided that entering payments and reconciling the checks and remittance advices should be done digitally. Additionally, they want their accounts receivable and customer sales subsidiary data stores to be saved in a database. However, they still want deposit slips to be done on paper manually. In Visio, we're going to add a line around our external entities. and also around those processes that will still be done manually. We're going to make these a dashed line, make them a little bit thicker. Okay, so that's our first step. Our second step is to add implementation details. So for example, for our data stores, we'll say what database those will be saved in. So we've got perhaps a SQL Server database with an accounts receivable table in it. Let's edit our data flow from payment information to SQL Server AR and customer table fields. Because there might be a lot of different fields that we're inputting into our database at this step. Let's say that the computerized process of entering payments and reconciling will be done in a program that we're creating using Java. So we'll just put Java underneath these process names. Even though we're still doing the deposit slips manually, we need to add implementation details here. We'll just say paper form. The checks and remittance advices are still paper forms, so we don't need to add a lot of new detail here. Now let's say that in addition to the main functions of the system, we've also decided that we need to back up our reconciliations. We could add a system-related data flow and data store to account for this. We'll say backup files created in Java-based reconciliation system as our data flow. And we'll create a specific data store that we'll call external hard drive backup files. So now we've completed the three main steps to convert our logical DFT into a physical DFT. Now let's talk about transforming our logical data model. Again, this won't be on the exam. It's material from ISDS 402, but you should review it and you'll need to do this for your project this semester. The logical ER diagram depicts the business view of the data. It omits some key implementation details. Having determined the data storage format, physical data models are created to show implementation details and to explain more about the how of the final system. Here are the steps to create the physical database design. These steps apply if you're implementing a relational database. Steps might be slightly different for other types of databases. First, add primary keys. These are often the same as your identifiers in your logical data model. Next, add intersection tables to replace many-to-many -many relationships with two one-to-many relationships. Next, add foreign keys to represent relationships. You'll recall that the way you do this depends on the type of relationship. If you have a one-to-one -one relationship, the primary key in either one of the tables, but not both, becomes a foreign key in the other table. If you have a one-to-many relationship, then the primary key in the one table becomes a foreign key in the end table. We'll see some examples of this in just a second. 
Finally, you need to add data types for all of your fields, which were formerly called attributes. You can see a full list of data types at the URL listed here. This website lists them for several different common database management softwares, starting with Microsoft Access, MySQL, and ending with SQL Server. Let's go through each of these steps using an example. In this example, the logical ER diagram is tracking courses, customers who take those courses, and employees who teach those courses. You can see that customers can take from zero to many courses, and each course can hold from zero to many customers. Each employee can teach zero or more courses, and each course is taught by one and only one employee. Let's convert this to a physical data flow diagram. The first step is to add primary keys. If we've done a good job in our logical ER diagrams, we already had good identifiers set up, so we can simply call those identifiers our primary keys. In Visio, it's easy if you're using the crow's foot diagram template to add primary and foreign keys, simply by right-clicking and saying set primary key or set foreign key. The next step is to create intersection tables to replace many-to-many -many relationships. As you know from 402, it's impossible to directly implement many-to-many -many relationships in a relational database. In this example, we have a many-to-many -many relationship between customer and course, so we need to add an extra table between those tables. Usually, intersection tables have a name that is a combination of the two tables that hold the many-to-many -many relationship. In this case, we've added a customer course intersection table. Sometimes the intersection table will have additional attributes. In this case, we've added class notes and grades. Sometimes the intersection table won't contain any other attributes besides only the primary keys of the other two tables. The intersection table will always have a composite primary key with both of the primary keys from the other two tables. The next step is to add foreign keys to represent the relationships. In a one-to-many relationship, the way that you do this is to take the primary key on the one side and add it as a foreign key in the many side. So for example, we have a one-to-many relationship between employee and course. Each course can be taught by only one employee, so we need to add an attribute to the course table which is the primary key of the, of the employee table. And we will set this field as a foreign key. In the intersection table, the primary keys are also the foreign keys of their related tables. So you can see we've got a one-to-many relationship between customer course and course. So we've taken the primary key from the one side, the course side, and added it as a foreign key in the many side, the customer course side. Same with the customer ID from the customer table. The final step is to add data types for each of the attributes. We can do this by clicking on an attribute name, editing it, adding a colon, and stating what data type it is. A first name could be a text type. If we're using SQL Server, that's called a varchar type. And in parentheses, we put how many characters will be in this field. We'll say up to 20 characters for a name. And we go through and do that for each of our of the attributes in the table. We could store gender as a one character string. Height and weight we could store numerically, for example with an integer, and so on. Once we've completed all of these data types, we will have converted our model into a physical database design. I've added the Visio files that I used in the examples to Titanium so you can use them as templates for your homework and the project.